So thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and first, I'd like to uh, begin by thanking the organizers for this wonderful uh, co conference here today, uh, as well as the opportunity to uh, present our research uh, at this conference. Uh, so today, I'd like to talk to you about our work of laser cooling molecules. Uh, and you've already heard throughout this week of various applications for ultracold molecules. So ultracold molecules can be used uh, for precision measurements, and you heard about this from both uh, Mike as well as Eric, as how uh, molecules these days are actually setting the most stringent limits uh, to searches, for example, for the electric dipole moment, where current state-of-the-art experiments actually reach mass ranges that f actually exceed what the LHC can reach. One can also study cold and ultra-cold collisions with molecules, and you heard a bit about this from June and their pioneering work uh, at Jilla uh, on quantum state controlled uh, collisions, uh, as well as there's been a lot of work uh, since then, past decade, really trying to understand what happens when two molecules collide. And this actually turns out to be filled with a bunch of very rich physics. Uh, for example, uh, the concept of sticky collisions, which uh, there's actually been quite a bit of uh, experimental uh, work down now to try to understand, uh, as well as even new experiments that actually show you the product state distributions of what happens when these molecules collide. And finally, molecules can be used for quantum simulation and quantum computation. Uh, you heard a bit about the quantum simulation aspect from Zoe's talk yesterday. And I just want to focus a bit more on why uh, molecules are such good candidates for quantum simulation and quantum computation. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that molecules have long-range dipolar interactions. And these dipolar interactions can be tuned to, to basically uh, any level that you want. Uh, and they can also be, uh, the molecules themselves can be uh, controlled and coupled to various external fields uh, throughout the ENM spectrum. Molecules on their own also have very long coherence times, and the system as a whole is quite easily scalable. Uh, and because of these benefits, uh, there's been a lot of theoretical work over the years uh, that have looked at using ultracool molecules for quantum simulation, and also more recently uh, for use with quantum computation. And I want to point out some uh, recent work from the QSUM collaboration uh, that looks specifically at ultra-cold calcium fluoride molecules uh, in optical tweezer arrays. Uh, and they found that with fairly reasonable experimental parameters, one could expect uh, reaching gate fidelities with over four nines. Uh, in the future, one could also uh, implement uh, error correction on this platform. And there's been some theoretical work actually already looking into this. Now, what platforms actually exist for, to do these applications, whether it be for quantum simulation, quantum computation, or even studying collisions? Uh, well, one of the platforms that has really gained a lot of uh, popularity in the recent years are these uh, optical tweezer arrays. And you heard about this earlier in the week from uh, Adam and Manuel, about how one loads uh, individual tweezer arrays uh, with either one or no atoms, and then one can rearrange these into any arbitrary dimension uh, any arbitrary pattern, whether it be in one dimension, two dimension, or even in three dimensions. And there's, of course, a very natural extension to this platform for ultra-cold molecules. All we need to do is replace these atoms with molecules. Uh, so that's what I'll be talking to you about today, our work of loading uh, ultra-cold molecules into these optical tweezer arrays. Uh, and I also wanted to point out that uh, there's several other groups, uh, both at Princeton and also in Conquin's group at Harvard, that now also have uh, these ultracold molecules in these tweezer arrays. Now, how do we actually produce the ultracold molecules such that we can load them into our tweezer arrays? Uh, so really, the production of ultracold molecules, there's two distinct classes of, of uh, methods over the years that have been uh, developed. Uh, the first is indirect method. So this is the method of uh, cooling uh, atoms to ultracold temperatures and then associating them uh, into ultracold molecules. Uh, but today, what I'd like to focus on is uh, direct uh, cooling methods, and specifically focusing on laser cooling of molecules. Uh, and there's uh, quite a few advantages as to why you'd want to laser cool molecules, uh, the main being that uh, you now have access to all of the uh, uh, cooling techniques that have been developed for ultra-cold uh, atoms can now be applied to ultra-cold molecules. Uh, this allows us to do, for example, a direct imaging and non-destructive detection of our molecules, uh, and it's also not limited to uh, being applicable to uh, species where each, in, each individual atom within your molecule can be laser-cooled. And you'll see that this becomes relevant, for example, 
uh, for complex polyatomic molecules, uh, which can also be laser cooled, as you'll hear from both uh, later in this talk as well as the Bion's talk next. Nevertheless, laser cooling of molecules remains challenging. And this is from the very simple uh, fact that when you excite a molecule up to some excited state, it has a chance that it can decay not just back to the state you saw it in, but to a whole host of different internal rotational and vibrational states. Uh, and over the years, people have developed techniques as to how we can actually laser cool these molecules. Uh, so for, it was pointed out back in 2008 uh, that one can achieve rotational closure by simply uh, optically cycling on a transition uh, from the n equal one state, n is a rotational quantum number, up to the n equal zero state. And because of parity selection rules that exist within these molecules, uh, this guarantees that you then will decay back to the n equal one state uh, and thus achieve rotational closure. Now, as far as vibrational states are concerned, this actually turns out to be a very large class of molecules that exist uh, that support laser cooling. And these are these so-called uh, metal-centered uh, S-orbital molecules, where you have a metal attached to some uh, ligand with a single bond. And because of orbital hybridization during the actual bonding process, you'll see that actually the electron wave function gets very localized just around the metal atom and not around the actual molecular bond or the ligand on this side. And this means that essentially what you've done now is you've decoupled the uh, electronic structure from that of the molecular excitations. So this means that now this uh, molecule is almost atom-like when it comes to laser cooling, uh, and this allows us to now uh, cycle many photons on this molecule before it decays to higher-lying uh, vibrational states. With uh, these discoveries, uh, there's been a lot of uh, recent work on laser cooling of diatomic molecules, uh, so today I'll be talking to you about our work on laser cooling calcium fluoride, uh, but there's also a pioneering work in Dave DeMille's group on laser cooling strontium fluoride, uh, as well as laser cooling of yttrium oxide, which also has narrow line transitions for future, uh, which looks very promising for future laser cooling applications. Uh, there's many new uh, species that are also being laser cooled these days. Uh, there's uh, these aluminum and magnesium uh, molecules, which have very low mass and UV transitions, which promise uh, potentially very large uh, deceleration rates, uh, which allows for larger molecular MOTs, as well as molecules that have uh, chemistry and precision measurement relevance, uh, as well as heavy molecules, which are sensitive to uh, the EDM, uh, to electron EDM searches. And there's many new uh, species that are uh, actively being considered as well. So the path we've, we take towards laser cooling of molecules is as follows. Uh, we start with uh, buffer gas cooling of our uh, molecular source, and we apply laser slowing to these molecules. We then load them into a magneto-optical trap where we perform further subdoppler cooling, and this allows us to then load them into uh, optical traps. Uh, and with, these, with this roadmap, there's uh, been several different groups that have achieved uh, molecular MOTs these days. Uh, so, uh, in our uh, MOT, we typically get something on the order of about 10 to the 5 molecules, and these molecules are on the order of about 300 microkelvin or so. Uh, later on in my talk, I'll show uh, we now have built up a new experiment, and we now routinely get well over a million molecules in these molecular MOTs. Now, the temperature in the molecular MOT is quite hot, so we need to perform further cooling. Uh, and the way we do this is uh, by using uh, another trick that the AMO community has developed, which is uh, lambda-enhanced gray molasses cooling. And the way this works is that this combines gray molasses cooling, uh, where you have a AC stock-shifted bright state as well as a dark state, and due to motional coupling from your dark state into your bright state, you ride up this potential hill, get excited up, and fall back down, and this is a Sisyphus-like cooling technique. This is then combined with the fact that if you have a three-level system, uh, you'll have a coherent dark state for zero velocity. This is commonly referred to as VSCPT, or Velocity Selective Coherent Population Trapping. And when you combine these two techniques, what we see uh, is that we're, very, we're, we're able to very effectively cool these calcium fluoride molecules uh, down to about four microkelvin when we're, we park on this uh, lambda feature. Now that we have ultra-cold molecules, the next thing we can do is move towards optically trapping these molecules. Uh, and what we find is that when we overlap a far detuned uh, optical dipole trap potential, we see that our laser cooling still works in the presence of the trapping light, and this allows us to actually cool the molecules into uh, the ODT, thereby increasing the density of our samples. 
Uh, and we see that uh, at every step in the experiment, we gain a significant amount of phase space density. Because we're able to actually laser cool in the presence of this optical dipole trap, uh, it also means that we're able to image these molecules by simply collecting the fluorescence uh, from the, uh, the cooling light that are emitted from the molecules. So this means we now have basically everything that we need uh, for single shot detection of a single molecule. And at this point, we then moved on uh, to actually loading optical tweezer arrays of these molecules. Uh, so in each of these uh, 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 tweezers, uh, we now reach phase space densities of about 10 minus 4 or so. And these tweezers then also allow us uh, to then uh, do repeated imaging uh, with fairly high uh, fidelities and with fairly reasonable survival probabilities. We can rearrange these tweezers uh, in any dimension if we want, and we can also apply a coherent control of the molecules of the internal state within uh, the tweezer. Uh, so we can do this with a combination of optical pumping pulses as well as microwave pulses, and we can drive the molecule uh, to any internal state that we want uh, and drive coherent Rabi oscillations on that state. Now that we've gained basically all of this control, both in the sense of single particle control from the tweezers as well as the quantum state control uh, that I just mentioned, uh, the first thing we decided to explore was actually studying uh, collisions between molecules. So we now use this uh, tweezer platform to do this. Uh, the way we go about doing this is we load uh, two optical tweezers and prepare them in uh, whatever quantum state we want. We then merge the two tweezers together, wait for a variable amount of time for the collision to take place, and then we can re-separate the two tweezers and image the final uh, products. Uh, and we, of course, have to re-separate the tweezers before we image, because if we simply turn on the imaging light while the two tweezers are mer merged, we'll simply undergo light-assisted collisions of our molecules. So if we now post-select on experimental cycles where we run the sequence but only load a single uh, tweezer, we see that we see essentially no loss. By contrast, if we now post-select on experimental cycles where both tweezers are loaded, we see a very clear sign of collisions taking place. And we can map out this uh, collision rate uh, for a whole host of different internal states, whether it be the absolute ground state, a spin stretch state, or an excited rotational state. And what we find is no matter what state we're in, we basically always see universal loss. So this is uh, basically a very uh, common theme that keeps reoccurring in these ultra-cold molecules, as you heard about from June earlier. And whenever the molecules collide, they basically always uh, re uh, collide inelastically. Uh, and there's many different uh, uh, methods by which this can occur. Uh, one of the leading uh, uh, thoughts of why this is happening could, uh, can be this idea of uh, the molecules coming, by, coming together, forming a collisional complex, and then getting photo excited uh, by the actual trap light. So what we actually would like to do is to somehow suppress this inelastic loss. Uh, so this brings about the idea of shielding uh, transitions, shielding collisions. So as I mentioned, when molecules uh, come together at short range, they're very likely to undergo some sort of inelastic collisions. So the idea of shielding is quite simple. It's simply we want to somehow create some sort of long-range long repulsive potential such that these two molecules never actually make it to short range where they can, uh, where they can scatter inelastically. And there's many different methods by which uh, this can be done uh, by using electric field shielding, as you heard about from June earlier, uh, as well as using microwave shielding, uh, combinations of electric fields and microwaves, uh, as well as optical shielding. Specifically, we decided to investigate uh, this microwave shielding technique. Uh, so th the, uh, what we decided to do was to uh, look at this paper by Tice Common and Jeremy Hudson, where we now use the microwaves to basically prepare a dress state of our molecule. And in this dress state of this molecule, you'll see that we have, in the upper dress state, we'll have a repulsive dipole-dipole interaction that prevents the molecules from coming to short range. And then there's also a lower dress state, which is an anti-shielded state, which actually enhances the rate of these collisions. One more nice uh, benefit of this microwave shielding scheme uh, is the fact that the microwaves actually also enhance the rate of elastic collisions. Uh, so if you look here at the yellow curve, you'll see that as we turn on th these microwaves, the rate of elastic collision increases by over an order of magnitude. So this is, of course, what you want for future evaporative cooling because you want very high elastic uh, collision rates uh, with low inelastic rates. 
Now, there is one complication to this uh, scheme, uh, which is the fact that uh, you need quite high Rabi frequencies uh, with quite high polarization purity, and specifically quite high circularly polarized microwaves uh, at 20.5 gigahertz. And of course, this becomes an experimental challenge because in the lab, all of this takes place inside a metal chamber, which of course reflects all the microwaves in every direction. Uh, there's several other uh, complications we had to overcome, uh, but the main way that we produce uh, these circularly polarized microwaves is with a helical antenna array. Uh, and it turns out that one of the main limitations of this, of this shielding scheme has to do with the fact of having microwave phase noise. So let me try to explain this. Uh, so I mentioned earlier in the dress state picture, we have both this shielded state as well as this anti-shielded state. And the separation between these two states is set by your microwave Rabi frequency. But now if your microwaves now have phase noise at the Rabi frequency, this in essence becomes a direct drive from this shielded state into this anti-shielded state. And we can see that this is indeed the case experimentally. If we simply prepare the molecules uh, in this upper dress state, uh, we can see that depending on how much phase noise we have in our microwave source, uh, the lifetime of this dress state is directly proportional to that. So once we uh, get all of these complications uh, uh, taken care of, uh, we were then able to create quite circularly polarized microwaves with quite high Rabi frequencies. Uh, so we achieve Rabi frequencies around up to about 30 uh, megahertz and have a power, basically a cleanliness of our circular polarization of about 100 to 1. With this, we can now go back and do the same uh, experimental scheme that we did earlier, study collisions, but this time we now turn on this shielding uh, once the two uh, tweezers are merged during the collisions. Uh, and we see that uh, when we now prepare the molecules in this upper dress state, we see that the, the rate of inelastic loss is suppressed by about a factor of six uh, in comparison to this, the bare ground state. We can also prepare, for example, the lower dress state, and we can see that the rate of collisions is actually increased. But maybe more interesting uh, here is the fact that uh, if you look uh, at the suppression factor that we reach of about a factor of six, in combination with the increase in elastic collision rate we expect, uh, you'll see that the gamma, or, or basically ratio of elastic to inelastic loss, uh, sh should be above 50. So this looks very promising for future evaporative cooling of these molecules. Uh, so we decided to actually go out and actually measure what is the elastic rate, uh, and we find that it does indeed agree with the theoretical calculations, which confirms that we do have a quite high uh, gamma within this system. Uh, we tried very quickly some forced evaporation with these shielded molecules. Uh, unfortunately, we then ran into the same limitation I mentioned earlier of microwave phase noise limiting how long we could evaporate for. And with the limited density that we have, we only had something about a 30% uh, decrease in temperature. But I want to point out some very recent work uh, from MPQ, which has now used this microwave shielding technique uh, and due to their much higher initial densities, they're able to very uh, effectively evaporate uh, their uh, NAK molecules to below uh, quantum degeneracy. So now that we have uh, basically the collisions under control, uh, the next thing we wanted to look at is what is the actual uh, single particle coherence times that we can have in these tweezer systems. Uh, so specifically in, uh, in these tweezer traps, we have very high intensity of light fields. Uh, so we need, to make sh we need to find a way to suppress the, the, the light shifts on our transitions, which can cause decoherence. And for this, we park at a magic angle condition. And we see that when we park on this magic angle condition, uh, we're able to get quite long uh, coherence time. So for a, sing for a, a simple Ram Ramsey uh, uh, spectroscopy sequence, we see that we get about 100 milliseconds coherence time. And if we add a spin echo pulse, we get about a half second coherence time. But maybe even more promising is the fact that uh, if we now look at the molecule temperature versus this decoherence rate for just a uh, Ramsey uh, sequence, uh, we see that we, it scales linearly, which means that if we are able to further cool these molecules in the future, we'll be able to get even longer coherence times of these molecules in these tweezer traps. Nevertheless, even this uh, 100 millisecond R Ramsey coherence time is already significantly longer than the predicted gate times uh, for if you have uh, two uh, calcium fluoride molecules in neighboring tweezers. So in essence, this is already looking like this will be a useful qubit in the future. Uh, so to actually go about using uh, these calcium fluoride tweezers for, f 
for future quantum computation, we've been building up a new next generation apparatus. Uh, so this uh, new uh, apparatus has much higher NA, allowing us to have much, tightly f much more tightly focused uh, tweezers. This allows for better future Raman sideband cooling of these molecules, as well as the ability to ha have high uh, voltage electrodes uh, to fully polarize the molecules. And also the system is compatible to be cryogenic for longer uh, lifetimes, both for vacuum as well as black body uh, suppression of, of vibrational uh, transitions. Uh, and just a few highlights from this new uh, uh, apparatus. Uh, so now we're able to get much larger molecular mots of well over a million molecules per shot. Uh, and we can now also do a, a very rapid optical transport and with a combination of a moving lattice plus a moving ODT to transport the molecules from the, the MOT into the glass cell region where they can be imaged with this high NA objective. And we can do this transport uh, quite quickly in under 50 milliseconds. And with that, we're then able to then load uh, these much larger tweezer arrays of calcium fluoride molecules. Uh, so as an outlook on the calcium fluoride side, uh, so in the future, we want to uh, implement Raman sideband cooling uh, of these molecules within the tweezer traps, uh, as this will get us much longer coherence times uh, that we'd want in the future. We're also interested in looking at dipolar interactions between uh, these molecules, as well as performing two qubit gates in the near future. In the future, one could uh, do quantum simulation of spin lattice models, as well as looking at optimized pulse sequences for higher fidelity gates, or looking at ways of increasing the interaction strengths between uh, tweezer traps, either uh, with, uh, by tuning the tensor polarizability or uh, using hybrid systems. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank the CAF uh, team that uh, made all of this work uh, possible. Uh, so uh, Sean, uh, Yi Chang, Scarlett, uh, and Derek, as well as our PI John, as well as the collaborators on the CF experiment, Wolfgang, Conquin, and me, and Ty's comment for all of the theory. Now, everything that I've talked about so far has been for a diatomic molecule. But as I mentioned earlier, because of the choice, because of the way this orbital hybridization works, one can imagine simply replacing the ligand, which is a fluorine right now, to something more complex. And you could even imagine going to even more complex molecules. But for this, stay tuned for the next talk uh, from Debye, who will talk more about this. And why would we want to go to these more complex polyatomic molecules? Well, this has to do with the fact that when you move to a polyatomic molecule, you've now gained uh, angular orbit orbital momentum around the internuclear axis. And this gives rise to now very uh, nearly degenerate opposite parity states. And this then allows you uh, to easily polarize your molecules at much lower and much more reasonable electric fields. On top of that, you'll see that uh, you're able to now fully polarize these molecules. So if you, for example, want to use this uh, for an EDM search or some other precision measurement, you'll see that because this is now saturated, you're no longer sensitive to small uh, electric field shifts within uh, your experimental system. Uh, so as I mentioned, these molecules can be used for precision measurements, uh, both uh, as a laser coolable EDM sensitive molecule, uh, which actually looks to be very promising with, with uh, possibilities of increasing the current limits on the electron EDM by several orders of magnitude. One could also look for uh, dark matter with these uh, molecules by comparing the, the transition frequencies uh, between uh, various bending mode and stretching modes, and that gives you a ratio of basically of the uh, proton to electron mass uh, ratio. One can study uh, cold and ultra cold collisions, but now with much more complex molecules that even chemists would consider real molecules. Uh, and then finally, one can uh, perform quantum simulation, quantum computation with these additional degrees of freedom. Uh, so for, over the past few years, we've been uh, working to achieve laser cooling of a polyatomic molecule, specifically on calcium OH. Uh, and now there's basically three degrees of freedom that we need to take into account to actually laser cool these molecules. So there's the stretching mode, which is akin to the, the uh, vibrational modes we had earlier. But now we also have this bending mode I talked about, as well as a hybrid mode of these two. And this causes additional decay pathways when we actually go to laser cool these molecules. Uh, but if we apply enough laser uh, repumpers, we can actually cycle over 10,000 photons 
uh, on this molecule. Once we can cycle 10,000 photons, we can now go back and basically do all of the, what we, I talked about earlier on calcium fluoride, but on the CAOH molecule. So we can create a magneto-optical trap of these molecules, uh, and we can also then perform the same or very similar sub-Doppler cooling, both this uh, lambda-enhanced gram molasses cooling, uh, as well as single-frequency cooling, where we're able to cool these molecules down to uh, below 20 microkelvin. We can then load them into an optical dipole trap, and again, we see that the, the cooling works in the presence of this optical trapping light, uh, thereby increasing the density of our molecular sample. Once we have them trapped in this, in this uh, optical dipole trap, we can now start studying uh, the more basic properties of this molecule. Uh, specifically, we can look at what is the actual lifetime of this bending mode, which is what we want for future science applications. Uh, and we see that we've, we get a, a, a spontaneous lifetime on the order of about 600 milliseconds, uh, which actually agrees quite well uh, with theory uh, calculations from our collaborators at John Hopkins. Now, the last thing we've been working on is to actually regain this single quantum state control that we had in the diatomics, but in this bending mode of this polyatomic. So when we simply optically pump the molecules into this bending mode, you'll see that they, uh, uh, they're in all of these different internal states. Uh, but then with a combination of optical pumping pulses as well as microwave pulses, uh, we're able to optically pump these molecules into a single quantum state. And maybe more interestingly, uh, if you look at this level structure here, I'd just like to point out that right above here, there's actually an EDM-sensitive state. Uh, so this has actually led to a new collaboration effort uh, with Caltech that we're working on, which is to actually do a roadmap experiment of an electron EDM search uh, within these polyatomic molecules. And as Eric pointed out earlier in the week, uh, in these polyatomic molecules, you have these co-magnetometer states that allow you to uh, reject uh, uh, systematic errors very well, but now these molecules are also laser coolable. Uh, in addition, they also have uh, the presence of, of, for example, zero G factor states, uh, which uh, seem very useful for rejecting systematic errors uh, in the future. So with that, I'd like to conclude by uh, just a brief outlook on what we're doing with these polyatomic molecules. Uh, we're working on realizing uh, this roadmap experiment for CAOH, uh, for, for an electron EDM with CAOH, uh, as well as realizing uh, optical tweezer arrays with these polyatomic molecules. Uh, and maybe I'll just like to conclude with the idea that uh, as we gain more and more complexity in these quantum systems, we end up uh, gaining possibilities in future applications, whether it be uh, for uh, quantum simulations or uh, future precision measurements. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, the whole team uh, responsible for the CAOH work, uh, Nathaniel, uh, Christian, Page, and Andrew, as well as our PI John, uh, and as well as our Caltech collaborators on the EDM roadmap experiment, Nick and Arian, and our theory collaborators, uh, Lan and uh, Shokuan. And thank you for your attention. We have a question back there. Yeah. Okay. The mic's going to come to you. Thank you. Um, could you give a, a physical picture on why, so on the graphs that you have for the microwave shielding, with uh, one branch being repulsive and one other branch being attractive, uh, why does not that depend also on the orientation that the uh, molecule have with each other when they approach? Especially you have a circularly polarized light, well, RF light, uh, and so. There is some access, right? So, yeah. so the access, how does that depend? The, the quantization access is actually set by a, a, very, a weak magnetic field that we apply. Mm -hmm. So we apply a weak magnetic field that sets the quantization access, and then the, the, the shielding takes place with circularly polarized light that's uh, basically going in the direction of the magnetic field. Yes. So, so then why are molecules approaching like side by side with respect to this axis and on top of each other with respect to this axis? Why do they... I have the impression in this cartoon picture that they, they experience the same shielding potential, basically. You mean in this upper address state here? Yes. So in, in this upper address state, basically when, I guess, I'm, you can think of it kind of as a cartoon picture, that instead of the molecules, so the molecules, so this is in the, in the dress state picture, but the molecules, instead of colliding basically in some attractive fashion, say, head on, they're now oriented in some way that they, see a repulsive potential instead of an attractive 
potential from your dipole. Yeah, so it's, it's the same in all directions? Yes, this works in 3D. Yes. Okay, I guess I don't really see why uh, it's the same in all directions. It sounds a bit weird to me. Um. Uh, I don't know if I can give you an intuitive picture of okay. why that is, yeah. Sorry. Okay. We have a question here. Hi, Loic. Uh, nice talk. Uh, I have a question about the calcium fluoride. I wonder, like, what is the anticipated challenge of uh, implementing calcium fluoride as a qubit compared to other species? So I, I think the main limitation right now is just uh, we don't have them in the ground motional state of our tweezer trap. Uh, there's a nice theory proposal uh, for Mike Tarbett's group as to actually a Raman cooling scheme that could work for uh, calcium fluoride, uh, but we have not actually worked towards implementing this yes, but yet. But we don't foresee any major limitation besides just uh, being able to cool them down to the ground state to get rid of any sort of motional dephasing. Thank you. We have a question up in the gallery. You'll have to really shout it out. Any other questions? Any other questions? We'll go to you. If it's a short question, we'll have some time for that. Hi, thank you. Nice talk. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, you're using calcium fluoride, where the fluorine comes from the good 17, ne very negative uh, element. Uh, what is the reason of using uh, group 2 element, for example, calcium? Uh, so what you want to find is basically, so if, if I go back to the, the picture here. So you want to have a single uh, unpaired electron in the outer shell. So that kind of tells you what combination of molecules you want. Uh, basically anything in that column can then be paired with the fluorine column, uh, and these tend to all be laser coolable. Uh, you can then also move basically across the periodic table uh, to still have one uh, free electron, uh, and some of them are laser coolable, some of them are not. Uh, but we, we, want it, we want one uh, unpaired electron. Okay. We have uh, time for one very short question and a hopefully very short answer as well. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you described this collision problem, which you solve in, in, in large part with this microwave dressing, and speculated that it had to do with the fact that uh, the two molecules come together, form a complex, and that complex gets excited by the tweezer light, which I think is a perfectly reasonable uh, 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 mechanism. But have you tried varying the frequency of the tweezer laser to see whether you could suppress that process if that is what was going on. Yeah, so we don't really have uh, access to do this. So uh, in uh, the theory cal uh, calculations that uh, have studied this, uh, you'll see that actually the, the light intensity you have in a typical optical dipole trap or tweezer trap light is many, many, many orders of magnitude saturated. So uh, there's some nice experiments from both uh, Simon Cornish's group as well as Con Quinn's group, where they're able to uh, actually study this by strobing their actual trap light on and off. And then they can study basically the duty cycle of when the light is on and off versus just an average potential light, and then they can see this effect. Uh, but uh, in a tweezer trap, uh, we, we could do this, but we have not done that. All right, let's uh, thank Loic again.